Ladies and gentlemen, today is the very intense October 13th, 2018, and this is the Kay and Kale Show, episode 375, where we learn to be better artists. My name is Ken Lafferty, and I would like to welcome you to, yes, that's right, a very intense episode, because today we're going to be talking about intense lighting right on over here with the intense lighting that's going on in the Made of Metal, <laughs> the Made of Metal album cover. I'm sure you can already tell what the theme of today is going to be. We're going to be doing some intense studies, and I'm going to show you guys all of the techniques that went into this. We can go ahead and dissect this uh, PSD layer by layer till we get all the way, all the way back to the good old line art, okay? And you can be following along with this if you download on Patreon up in the corner or down in the description. All right, with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it. So let's go ahead and just build this back up real quick. And I gotta tell you guys that, yeah, while all of the bells and whistles and little titles and the finished piece is always nice to look at, when you're setting up a piece, the most important thing to consider is your foundation. Where does your piece start? Where does your actual piece start, okay? And I've actually figured out a way, I hope this works, for me to be able to create, yeah, notes, awesome. Awesome, let's go ahead and jump into it. Okay, so uh, this was the actual foundation of the piece and we can take a step back to um, an even more important step and that is never getting hung up on just one piece. You can see throughout here, we're exploring a bunch of different thumbnails, right? We call this thumbnailing where you're drawing in just shapes and you're trying to figure out different compositions for your piece. I cannot stress enough the importance of this exercise because what it does is it warms up your mind. It warms up your mind and it allows you most importantly to not get stuck on just one idea, not just one idea. And what's really cool about this is that you can start kind of throwing in shapes and notice also that I'm working in black and white. I'm not even worrying about color yet. And this is the first step in, in actually creating an intense lighting or like a very dramatic lighting piece. Okay, is you wanna make sure that you get your shapes and your reads in. And what you're dealing with here is contrast. Contrast. Notice how some of these are low contrast. This one up here is low contrast. See the light gray, uh, but then there's like a lighter gray background and then the windows behind. But then see how there's heavy contrast. Heavy contrast within here and like these dark pieces throughout this, uh, in this piece and also in here. Dark contrast creates intense lighting, or, or high contrast creates intense lighting rather, okay? And low contrast can sometimes give you a different mood. Like notice how low contrast pieces uh, will sort of give you a slightly different mood, almost like a dreamy state. Uh, it also is nice for uh, glamour shots. When you want a character to look more appealing or more beautiful, Oftentimes, diffused and not dramatic lighting or not intense lighting can help. Uh, but that might be another tutorial for another time. But long story short, the reason why soft lighting works better in, that, in those cases, and actually there's still a way that we can do it, and I actually did it here, and I'll talk about that in just a second, uh, it's because there's no harsh shadows. There's no harsh shadows. It doesn't show all of the the uh, like different irregularities in your face, right? Here we can get away with it because all we're doing is that trendy little Instagram or the, the trendy nose shape, right? That, that's a really easy way to put an intense lighting on a face, but see how the rest of the face is still very, it's almost like one shade of color. Even like these little pieces up here that are occurring here, very low contrast, low contrast. Therefore, it makes our face flat. It flattens the face. It makes it look simpler. It makes it look like a porcelain doll. It makes it look beautiful. Okay. So always keep that in mind. Always keep that in mind. And see, once we get out here to like the harsh shadows, these harsh transitions, now we're into like the hand stuff that's not as important. Um, it can receive that intense lighting and not look weird or out of place. But anyway, let's go ahead and jump into, I did mention something just a moment ago, and that is shapes. Shapes are one of the most important things that you want to consider when you are laying the foundation for an intense lighting piece. You can see here in the grayscale, I knew that I wanted my light source to come from the top, the very, very top, and just shining down, shining down and shining down on Mika, therefore creating these very, very graphic looking shapes. And it's gonna come in handy. Graphic is also another interesting word because the treatment, if you notice, the treatment, if you notice on this piece, is uh, very, very graphic. You can see that these shapes almost take on almost like a cutout, like a paper cutout shape, and they're just sort of layered together. But they feel, they still feel like they're actually being lit. Now, why is that? And that is the next point that we're gonna get to. <laughs> and this is going to blow your mind. We've talked about this before, 
We've talked about this before with uh, something called the color boomerang. Color boomerang is something that happens when you can, uh, and you can follow along with this, I highly recommend you do this, uh, eye drop, right, the light source, and then eye drop the transition. There's three different points here. There is the light source, there's the transition, and then there is the shadow, okay? Now, so many people, when they're coloring, oftentimes they think in terms of just light and shadow, but watch what happens when I just paint in the transition away from this. Watch how, without that transitionary color there, see how it loses a lot of the power, it loses a lot of the intensity, and now it starts to feel out of place. It feel, there's no rounding of this, there's no rounding of this actual uh, form here, and it's just all flat. It still looks okay, but notice how much more power is added with the transition, okay? Now here's the rule that I want you to be thinking about when you're working with these transitions. Here is the ultimate rule, okay? And it is as follows. Can I delete this? Okay, great. Okay, so what we're gonna do is now that we know that there's the light shape, right? This is going to be desaturated, okay? And I'm gonna zoom in here just so we can really drive this home. Really drive this home. I did do another tutorial on color boomerang, but in all honesty, it wasn't as good as I, as I would've hoped. But regardless, it's a new day and a new tutorial. So we're gonna go desaturated, then the saturation point, happens in our good old uh, transitionary point, then back to desaturated, back to desaturated in our shadows, okay? This is the general rule that I want you guys to follow. Uh, it doesn't happen with every single type of material, but for the most part, it always makes things look good, specifically in organic forms. So this is like hair and skin. You can see even in the skin, similar things are happening. It's even exaggerated to the point where it's a little bit more stylistic. I personally really like this. So you have these graphic shapes, but see how, and it's very, very subtle. Can you see these changes, the saturation right there, the desaturation, and then the desaturation here? Okay, the same principle is at work. But let's go ahead and get rid of these notes for just a moment. And I wanna show you exactly what's happening with saturation, desaturation, and all that stuff, right? Like, what does that actually mean? Okay, and you can see that by taking the color picker and go ahead and pick this color and see how it's like, it's not all the way up and to the right, right? Right means saturated. Up and to the right means uh, intensity, right? Intensity and saturation. Going all the way up and to the right is something that I highly discourage people from. I highly discourage you from going up and to the right. Uh, only in very, very specific circumstances. If you're ever going to have the full intensity of a color, be sure it's very, very sparingly. Uh, and, and it actually can help for like magic effects and stuff like that. For the, for the most part, in, the, in real life and with more realistic lighting, Type of, uh, type of setups, you're not gonna see uh, super saturated uh, colors like that, okay? So anyway, so we're gonna go desaturated. So see how we're hanging right out, kind of in the middle. And then we're gonna go to our, oh, look at that. You see how it moves down? Actually, that's really cool. I don't remember seeing it do that real time. That's really awesome. That's really awesome. I think that's an upgrade. That's a new uh, update to Photoshop. Heck yeah, that makes it look even better. Okay, so now we can actually watch the travel of our color picker. So it's moving down into the right. It's darkening, but also saturating. Now watch what happens when we go to the shadow. Can you guess what's going to happen? Yes, of course, we're going to go down. But which way is it going to move? It's going to go down into the left. See that? Look at that boomerang effect. Look at that boomerang. Uh, see, we're right at the top. We chuck the boomerang and it goes woo like that. It doesn't, I mean, it's technically not a boomerang because it's not returning to us, but it creates a curvature. Uh, you could call it the, the color parabola if you want to, if you're a mathematician, <laughs> okay? So here we have our parabola and you can see what's happening here. This is the basis of all of your intense lighting situations. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the skin. Let's take a look at what's happening with the skin. Same thing. We're gonna be desaturated peach here. Then we're gonna go saturated because we're actually uh, going up and to the right. Now, why is that? Uh, personally, this might not be fully realistic, but it looks cool and it looks stylistic and it's fun. And it's still a, a similar uh, rule that's happening here. We're moving from the right to the left first. And then as we go to the skin, look at that. We drop down and to the left, down and to the left. And then look, over here, we even push even further to the left. We're pushing super far to the left, desaturating at the very bottom of this face. So our color parabola looks something more like this. So it goes up and down 
and then to the left. Man, that's really cool how that animates like that. I totally never noticed that until today. <laughs> that makes this, this, this tutorial is like so much cooler because of that. Okay, so anyway, so that is the most important thing that I want you guys to be thinking about. Now, next up, let's talk about material. Material has another really, really big uh, influence on how your lighting is going to be interpreted. Okay, so for instance, do you see how the colors or the light is very intense on this on this leather jacket here? Let's go ahead and pull up our notes. I'll go ahead and make another another layer for notes. Let's pick a different color. That way it's clear to see, clear as day. There we go. Okay, so see how these colors on this jacket are all very, they're very, very bright, and then it immediately goes to dark. It immediately goes to dark. Um, and this is what allows you to get a feeling of not just high contrast because you're like, you would say, oh, Keenan, but the same thing is happening with the hair, right? The hair is also doing that same, uh, it's, exempl it's exemplifying that same uh, rule, the same rule. But I would say that it's actually not because notice how we have our leather, which is gray, right? And you might say, well, what's the transition color? Well, see how there's not really any transition color because it's all very desaturated. So here you wouldn't necessarily saturate and put in like this color. Cause see, once you start putting in this color, it looks, I mean, it might look okay, but I don't know. I, I personally don't like that color. It looks slightly out of place. Uh, it can be stylistic and it's up to you, but uh, not, all, not all materials behave in the same way. Okay, now case in point, the next thing about the the next thing about the the leather that makes it look super shiny is that we're allowing ourselves to go to a very very bright specular. Now, a specular is something that it, it basically is refracting nearly a hundred percent of the light, or it's like a reflection. It's a reflection because of the shininess of the surface, right? It's not always reflecting hundred percent of the light, but uh, you could add something like that into the hair. However, I specifically chose not to because I liked the way that the hair looked as that graphic shape. If I wanted to add in a specular, right? Watch what I do. I go up into the, the left. I'm heavily desaturating. If I wanted to add a, a, a specular to the hair, I felt like it was going to just slightly, it was going to complicate the piece too much. I wanted it to be much more simple and graphic, okay? So that's the next thing that you wanna consider. See, it looks okay there, but it's it's muddying up the piece too much. There's too much frequency now. I wanted those shapes on the hair to remain very, very vibrant pink, right? I didn't wanna to desaturate too much. However, on the leather, I wanted it to look very, very shiny. So that's why I allowed myself to put those extra, those extra speculars in there, okay? So, but again, pay attention to the contrast. Let's look at the contrast. Even though we don't have that transitionary color happening, we have, we're going from right here to all the way down here. See, look at that huge jump. We're moving from up here to way down here. A huge jump in contrast is what helps this also to look like leather. Uh, next up we have, next up we have another material and that is the stocking. Now notice on the stocking, there's a difference here because we do have a little bit more of a transition. There's a softer transition into our dark colors. And because of this softer transition, it allows the material to look less glossy, okay? Now, um, there is another one more thing that I wanna get into, and I'll probably save it to the very end because it has more to do with the stylistic choice of this. Uh, and it was actually a challenge that I ran into. In fact, we can just jump into it right now. The challenge that I had here was that I wanted this legging to feel like it was fabric. And I, and I wanted it to have a little bit of shine to it, right? Because of the elastic kind of fibers that sit in there. They create like this very, very subtle shine. Uh, but of course, I didn't want it to look like it was leather. So the, the first thing that I thought of was, well, why don't we just take a soft brush? Why don't we take a soft brush and just smooth this entire thing out? And the problem with using a soft brush is that because there's no other soft transitions in this piece, as soon as I start smoothing things out, yeah, it might look nice when you zoom in on it and look at it close up, which is what I was doing. I was looking at this close up as I was smoothing everything out. But the problem is, is that because there are hard transitions, there's almost like this cell shading treatment to the rest of the piece. See how now when I zoom out, See how now it, it looks okay, but it doesn't look like it belongs. It doesn't look like it's the same kind of chunky uh, paint. Like I wanted people to be able to see the actual paint strokes in this. 
So going from that to this, it is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's just the best thing to do. It's the best thing to do. I mean, I'm still torn on it because I look at it, I'm like, that, that technically looks nicer, but it just doesn't, like, it, it would have made me have to go through the entire rest of the piece and then make it kind of, make it match the same fidelity as this. And this is like pushing into more realism, more realism as far as the, as the materials are concerned. Okay, which isn't bad, but it's just something that you should consider. If you ever feel like there's parts of your piece that are feeling out of place, consider how you're treating the rest of your image. Consider the sort of paint strokiness or consider the sharpness of other shapes in your piece and other paint strokes in your piece. And then you might find yourself saying, oh, well, this looks out of place because it's, it's too soft. It's too soft and it looks weird. So all that out of the way, let's go ahead and begin dissecting this. Let's go ahead and dissect this one by one and then we are gonna go ahead and end it. So let's go ahead and begin with dissecting the Made of Metal uh, logo. So we're gonna go up here to the logo and you can see that all I did here was actually very, very simple. I just added all of these, all of these lines right onto, and this is just a straight up font. I think I ended up, did I rasterize this? I think I rasterized this. But yeah, this is just a regular Microsoft font, uh, obviously writing out the Japanese, which my friend Jordan was so nice to translate the made of metal into that. And then I just looked up like these death metal logos. Everybody knows what they look like. They just have like these vein things coming off of them. It looks like spider webs or like just different little tendrils kind of um, coming out of it. And uh, so that was fairly straightforward to do. And then I added this other little effect here to really kind of bring it out. It almost makes it look like it's inset when you set it up like this. See how it looks like it's almost like inset inside of this I don't know, it feels like it's like actually punched into the the album cover, and I really like that. A little bit of a happy accident, but uh, yeah, all those things can happen, and that is probably one of the biggest things that I wanted you guys to take home today, is that understand that when you're laying out these pieces, um, get, your, get your imagination going from the very beginning. You wanna get your imagination going from the very beginning, so that way you can have a bunch of different compositions, and one idea will feed, oftentimes feed into another and uh, you'll get some really cool results with that, okay? So let's go ahead and continue dissecting. Let's dissect. Okay, so this was the final, this was one of the final overpaints that I did here. And what I did was, this is just me making final adjustments to things like the guitar neck, uh, to Mika's eyes. There was a very, very small change that I wanted to make there. Mika's hands. Uh, yes, Mika's hands, as well as just other areas of the piece. Let's go ahead and get in here. So this is one of the bigger overpaints. And you can see um, by removing this, you can see one of the challenges that I ran into. And that was at the beginning, I wanted Mika's stockings to look completely different. I saw these really cool, I was actually walking around the mall and on the, one of the mannequins, it had one of these stockings on. It was really cool. It was like a mix between like a mesh stocking and then in the front, it had this really ornate kind of lace texture on it. And I wanted to try to get something like that in the piece, but this goes back to our styling issue. I, I struggled so much with these legs. It's like, it's not even funny. I spent so many hours like redrawing these stockings. But this goes back into another one of our styling points. And that is the reason why I felt like these didn't end up working was because these stockings to create this lace texture, it needed to have a bunch of high frequency lines or it needed to have a lot of high frequency detail. See how it has all of these little tiny details. And this is straight contrasting and sort of feeling out of place with everything else in the piece, which is like these large, huge, huge, um, huge deliberate shapes. Okay, and then you have all these little tiny things. It just felt out of place. I wasn't, it wasn't getting across right and I couldn't figure out a way. And this is probably just another error on my side is that I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out a way to make it work. So what I ended up doing, as you saw later, is that I did want some holes in there, but then I just ended up treating it as, again, higher frequency, larger shapes, uh, or <laughs> lower frequency, low frequency, big shapes, right? And then I feel like that blends a lot better with the rest of the piece because we don't have all these tiny little dots in there and it feels more graphic and deliberate. Deliberate, that's, that's the key word right there, okay? So let's go ahead and continue dissecting. Let us dissect these one by one. But yeah, these legs, oh, they gave me so much trouble. So much trouble. You can see all of these layers that just ended up 
And actually, like, even the anatomy of her legs ended up being kind of wonky. I ended up going back in there and, like, kind of fixing that up. Let's go ahead and back off here. And let us continue. Okay, so let's go ahead and get rid of all of this. So yeah, you can see I actually ended up just redrawing the entire legs. I looked at it for a moment and I said, I feel like her torso would have to be longer. I felt like it would need to be longer than that because I imagined, and this is also really good to do, is draw in the actual torso, draw in the anatomy whenever you're confused about where the character's uh, body should be. And I determined that the leg kind of coming up here, it was like too big, it was like too thick. I wanted to move it further down and have it skinnier. So it was almost like coming from this direction. And that is exactly what I ended up doing. So uh, you can see that right there. Okay, so see how I elongated the leg and I kind of pushed her bum further down to like elongate her torso. And I thought that looked really nice. So I hope you guys think <laughs> the same as well. So let's go ahead and continue dissecting, dissecting one by one. Lots of different, okay, so here's a good example. Another thing that I was struggling with was the treatment of this leg. You can see all of these different layers have different, uh, different lighting treatments on them. I was trying to figure out how to make it look like that, like the fabric legging with a little bit of sheen to it. Also adjusting values. Values is another really important thing to do. It was a little bit too dark. I considered, okay, well with this light that's coming from the top, this really intense light that's coming from the top, it would probably be affecting this leg a lot more. So I just put on, this is a soft light layer uh, with, I probably just use like a bright yellow, like a bright yellow light. And what I'll end up doing with pieces like this or with, um, with treatments like this, see, you can just take a soft brush and you can begin lightening up different portions of your piece just to change your values. And you don't have to go in there and always pick the same color or pick the right color. You can go in there and use the layer styles to your advantage. And I highly recommend that you do that. Okay, so continuing, let's go ahead and go back all the way. This is right when I repainted the leg. And that takes us back to the old one right there. Now let's go ahead and dissect this. Again, I made the value too bright here. This is, I went the other way and now the leg was too bright in terms of value. And now we have, yes can see here. Now we're getting into the overpaints. I want you guys to pay close attention to what's happening up here with Mika's face. Mika's face, um, all I'm doing here is I'm taking the lines that I had previously, and you'll notice that I've actually colored them a little bit. This is something that I've gone into in a previous episode called Lines with Life. This is one of my main, like main junction points with all of my drawings, because what I like to think of is all of my documents, all of my PSDs are basically sandwiches. I start with the middle piece. I start with the line art and then I'll put color underneath it, which you can see right here. All of this color goes underneath the lines. All of the color goes underneath the lines and you can see that all we're left with now is these lines. But see how there's color inside of them? That's because I've gone in there and I've actually added that color to them. See, originally the line art looked something like this. But the way that I'm adding color to it is, hey, see right over here, look down at these layers, see that locking mechanism? That's what I've done to lock my pixels. And I can go in there and now I can choose whatever color I want these lines to be. And this comes in really handy when you are wanting to soften your lines and prepare them for overpainting. Now, what I mean by that is, so take a look at these lines. If I color all of these lines just straight black, Pay attention. See how like up in the hair specifically, see how it becomes just like muddy. It starts to look like a comic book and it, it's not mixing well, but see how when they're brighter, oh, whoops. See how when they're brighter, it softens them. It makes them look more pleasing to the eye. It, so it's just the difference between that and that, that and that. This is one of the main things, the main things that allows me to branch from color or line, <laughs> color behind my line art and then going forward into overpaints, okay? So, and that is just by coloring the lines. I just showed, showed you how to do that. So get out there and do it. Okay, now let's go ahead and get back to the line art. We were talking about line art, talked it up so much. I like to put my money where my mouth is. Let's go ahead and talk about the line art. So the line art, again, it starts very, very simply on top of, on top of the thumbnail that we chose. 
So from here, I'll take my thumbnail, I'll blow it up to the entire canvas size, and then I'll lower the opacity. I'll lower the opacity to like maybe 20, 25, something like that. And then I'll begin throwing in my lines such as this. And I start with, see, I don't even bother drawing the clothes. I wanna make sure that I get the anatomy. I wanna get the pose right. I'm looking at things like the actual like lines of action. I'm looking at flow lines. I'm looking at flow lines. Where does all of these things, or where do all of these things point? And I'm very, very loosely sketching in. For all of you who have seen me sketch before, my sketches start out very, very loose and very, oftentimes very ugly as well. But that's because I allow them to be ugly, but I also expect them to have flow. I expect them to have lines of action. I expect them to have weight. And that is probably one of the most important things that you can do in the sketching phase is don't worry about, notice how I'm not going in there and I'm not starting with just trying to refine Mika's face. Right? I'm not going in there and like really trying to define these perfect, <laughs> I'm not trying to define these, these perfect anime eyes, right? I'm not going in there like this. Okay. So don't, don't ever do this type of stuff. Okay. Don't try to, don't try to uh, clean up your lines. Don't worry about any of that from the beginning. All you want to do is focus on capturing uh, an interesting expression, capturing motion. Uh, if your character is in motion or capturing weight and gesture. Gesture is another fancy way of saying like the natural flow of the body. Anybody who does a lot of figure drawing will notice that all poses of the human body always have a really cool uh, signature of gesture. And that's one of the most important things that you can do in your sketches. Okay, the next phase is the finishing up here. We're adding on the clothes. We're figuring out what clothes we want to wear. And again, the inspiration from this stuff comes from pictures online. Oftentimes when I'm going to the mall with my girlfriend, uh, we'll see the mannequins. They're always dressed up in like the latest fashion. So I'll see stuff like that. I'll take a picture of it. And then I will use that as my inspiration and my reference for the drawing. And I highly recommend you guys do that too. And with all of that out of the way, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and end today's show. I hope you guys enjoyed episode 375, intense lighting. I hope this was an intense tutorial. It definitely feels intense. Good thing I got the AC blowing above me and I got the noise cancellation on this, on this microphone so that way you can't hear it. I hope you guys enjoyed yourselves. Thumbs up if you like it, thumbs down if you don't. My name is Ken Lafferty. I will see you guys next time. Until then, I'm going to leave you with some lovely lane. Let me go ahead and pull that up. Um, go ahead and get some music going. Musica. And there's the good old lovely lane. All right, I'll leave you with that. Thank you guys so much for submitting your awesome artwork. And don't forget, if you want to get featured, send it on over. Send it on over to hashtag CanCaleFanArt. And I'll see you guys next time. Take care.
Seen a lot of Bowsette and a lot of My Hero Academia. Very good choices. Very good choices. Man, you guys are submitting so much stuff nowadays. I'm seriously gonna have to just make another series just to focus on this or something. I was seriously considering just making an entire episode where I just go through this stuff. But if I was also more frequent with my uploads, maybe we wouldn't have a billion of these to go through every time. Not that I'm complaining. I'm super happy that you guys send this stuff in. Please continue to do so. I love seeing you guys improve and solve it. Just all the stuff that you guys are currently into. Like I love seeing the video games and anime and babes and it's so cool. Pokemon, original characters, Inktober. You guys make me really proud. Very, very proud. <laughs> 